If you are out in the middle of nowhere like we are and you want to get connected, there's a number of different ways you can do so, but they all come with trade-offs. We'll go over how to get connected if you're out in the sticks on this episode of Cyber Weapons Lab. If you are living or staying in the absolute middle of nowhere, or even just off the beaten path, you might not get the internet speeds you would expect if you were in a city. Now, a lot of the time, in the United States anyway, this is because these rural communities are frequently only served by one provider, and these providers historically don't have a lot of pressure put on them to innovate or provide faster speeds when their customers have literally no one else to go to. Now, in the area that I'm in, Frontier is the only provider and is absolutely terrible, boasting speeds of maybe 10 up and sometimes even one down. So if you wanna get this kind of speed and consistency, this can still be a challenge if your only option isn't even cable because satellite providers like HughesNet or Clearview can be specific for uh, maybe areas with a lot of sky coverage or places where there's not a lot of other people who would be using it. But trust me when I say the latency on these solutions can be really terrible if you need to do things like audio calls. Now, another option is using a cellular LTE hotspot. And out here, sometimes a cellular hotspot is the really best you can do, but getting four or five bars is really, really important if you want to make sure you have the fastest possible speeds. So in order to do this, we're gonna go over some reasons why you might get terrible reception and some ways you can improve it, as was our case when we tried this out ourselves. Now last, there are some ways to actually bond all these together in order to get faster speeds, which is a little bit more advanced, but I wanna make sure you're aware of all the options that are out there. Otherwise, if you have just a bunch of hotspots and main internet connections coming in, you can end up with a house full of different hotspots boasting different speeds where you never know who's on what. So planning this out is something that you should probably do before jumping into purchasing a bunch of internet lines and finding out that most of them are terrible. Now, in order to follow along, you'll just need to be somewhere with generally terrible internet and few choices, and then we're ready to begin. Oh, and also, if you get confused, you can check out the Nullbyte article linked in the description because we're going to go over a lot of different hardware today, so you might need to catch up on links or otherwise wanna check out what we're talking about. So check it out in the description. If you live out in the middle of nowhere, then you might already be familiar with Frontier Communications. Now, this is a huge telecom company that is responsible for serving large parts portions of the United States. And in a lot of communities, it is the only DSL provider that anyone can really rely on. Now, Frontier is famous for uh, just not really investing very well in their network and also having only Comcast to compete with, who also no one likes. So you might see some news articles that are talking about uh, bungling network audits that reveal lots and lots of unsustainable infrastructure, preparing for bankruptcy because of not installing enough fiber, and also all sorts of states pursuing investigations into them because their speed is actually so slow that people in areas that don't have cell phone reception cannot call 911. So that is pretty terrible. And in our tests, we found that, well, for one, Frontier is incredibly inconsistent. So if you're dealing with one of these rural internet companies, you can expect that the people who are installing it might give you the runaround depending on who you call or what time of day you call. That is to say that the policies are inconsistent and sometimes they just can't find your address on the map. So talking to someone who's a little bit more experienced might be the difference between being told that they can service your location and that you are not able to get internet at all. Now, before I talk any more trash about Frontier, I will say that in terms of having a consistent, always-on connection running in the background, it is probably one of the best options out there, or DSL in general, uh, from one of these rural providers. But you have to keep in mind that the speeds you are going to get are probably going to be terrible, pushed down by lack of competition and aging DSL networks that don't have any incentive to change. Now, we went ahead and tested out our Frontier connection, and we got a whopping 7.5 megs download and 0.87 up, which is pretty consistent, unfortunately. And the one thing I will say about it that I really do like is it doesn't go out for absolutely no reason. 
Now, a lot of the other options we're talking about will either go down mysteriously when the cell tower goes down or just stop working when there's heavy weather when we're talking about satellite. So I will say that in spite of its many, many downsides, Frontier Internet or some other sort of rural provider of DSL might be your best option, provided you're willing to wait about two hours to upload about a gigabyte of data. Now that might sound horrible, and trust me, it is. But when you need to absolutely make sure that a connection is going to be stable over a long period of time, like you have to upload something, then this might be your best bet. All right, so let's say that you are one of those people that cannot be serviced by Frontier. Well, if you need to move up to the next tier of being out in the sticks, you can rely on something that doesn't even need a cell phone signal, and that is satellite internet. Now, I am not talking about the amazing new Starlink system that might be coming out in the near future. That is a lot lower orbit and is not geostationary. So you need a certain number of those satellites in order for that sort of internet to work, although it's supposed to be very fast. Now, the satellite internet of today is not very fast. It is in geosynchronous orbit, which is much higher. And when we were able to get HughesNet, a satellite internet provider, we were able to get a whopping 1.2 megs down and four, oh, sorry, 0.4 up. Now, sometimes we were able to get much improved speed and we were even able to get as much as 20 down one time. But the problem here is really latency. Now, let's say that you just need the basic sorts of speed to be able to do something like voice chat. Let's say you wanna have a conversation with someone or you need to, like me, for your work. A satellite interconnect connection has to go all the way up to a satellite and all the way back down to a ground station. So the latency on this is insane. Now, when I say crazy, I mean that someone will interrupt you six seconds later when you're talking crazy. So while it is kind of cool to be communicating with someone technically over a satellite phone, it's probably not worth it if you want to get started with this option and you actually need to do things that don't have crazy latency. So until Starlink comes out, I'm just gonna say that for a lot of things besides just browsing the internet and waiting for a really long time for a video to stream, uh, providers like HughesNet might not be a good option for you, especially if you have any obstructions. Now, in our case, we have two limiting factors. And uh, let's see. So you can see HughesNet offers a number of different plans. Uh, all these plans are, let's see, we'll do... Um, <laughs> yeah, it's about what I'm expecting. Sorry, we can't find your address, East Boise Avenue. Uh, so in general, these sorts of things, if you have for our case, a mountain or a long run of cable that needs to actually be run out to where the satellite's gonna be, your signal will be substantially degraded and you might find that you are without uh, any sort of signal whatsoever for extended periods of time during weather or other inclement conditions. Now here you can see the way that they do this is you actually do have caps. So while Frontier might have the same kind of cap you would expect from another internet company that has a reasonable cap that's pretty large, you might end up hitting a cap of like 20 gigabytes or something on a satellite plan and have already spent like $70. So keep in mind when you're out here, there's gonna be a lot of different options where it's really expensive to get the speed that you need, but you need to take a look at the different pros and cons where they might advertise, for example, pretty fast speeds, 25 download uh, speeds and three up. If you factor this into that, that there might be six seconds of latency, that might be totally unusable for whatever it is you wanna do. I'll say from my experience that I do not like satellite internet and I don't think I will be using it until it gets a little bit better. So. I will also uh, mention that we have a mountain directly in front of where it's supposed to be. So if you're in an area with a whole bunch of empty clear sky, you might have a substantially better or at least more consistent experience. Although I will say that these speeds are not impressive. Now, let's say that you want to do an unlimited plan on a phone. Well, if you have a Google Pixel like me, you might find out that there are some restrictions to this. Now, there are also plans for T-Mobile. And if you look at a T-Mobile, unlimited plan. There's a lot of attractive options that might make you think that it would be a good idea to just take an old cell phone, pop a SIM card in it, and get started. But the problem is that 
up to a certain uh, up to a certain point, they will start to throttle this. And the way that the network kind of understands this is different depending on the device that the SIM card is in. So if you have a phone, uh, and let's see, I'm not gonna, I'm actually not gonna go with this, but if you have a phone and you pop in a T-Mobile SIM card and you create a hotspot, it'll probably start throttling you maybe after 20 gigabytes or whatever the actual plan Oh, 50 gigabytes maybe, uh, or whatever the, the actual plan limit is. Now that might not be a big deal, but the problem here is, uh, oh, let's see, unlimited three gigabytes of 4T LTE delimited, then unlimited 3G. So you can see that some of these things will basically make it so that you're relying exclusively on 3G data, which is not gonna be the speed that you probably want. And, uh, oh, in this case, 20 gigabytes of 4G LTE data. So what does that mean? Well, that means that first, if you're tethering, the, your network might have other restrictions on how much you can tether data, and they might have their own cap on that. Second, if your phone is going to be using this data, then you might need to take a serious look at how much data it's going to be using and whether you need multiple lines. Because if you're uploading or downloading a lot of content, then this could come back to bite you really quickly. Now. Okay, another problem with this is antennas. Cell phones generally don't have the best antennas, so if you want a standalone solution, having an entire phone with the screen and all the other stuff that you're not gonna be using can be a pretty big waste of hardware when you could get something more simple and cheap. So the next step, uh, I don't know if it's up or down, but maybe sideways from this, is some sort of hotspot device where you just plug in a SIM card, and these are usually about the size of a, a small cell phone, and they're a dedicated device that generates a hotspot that you can connect to. Now, these devices are kind of like, I'll just type in Rocket Pack. Um, so these types of devices are really easy to set up. You can get a 4G LTE hotspot, uh, but the problem here is the same as a cell phone. While these do have better antennas, you can't do a directional antenna. So if you have a really faint cell phone signal as we do out here, then you're gonna be constantly going from room to room trying to find the one with the best reception. And then you might end up just taping it to a window as we did. Now these devices typically don't do well outside, so if you have one, you can expect to get maybe not so great speeds and maybe have a die if it rains. So uh, the trade-off here is you probably are gonna wanna put it outside or somewhere with really good signal and keep it there, but that, that place where the signal is best may not even be inside your house. So there are a lot of limitations with this, although I will say that uh, you know your network does know that this is also tethering data effectively. So in this case, you can still be subject to a lot of the tethering restrictions your network might have. Okay, so what's the solution here? Well, you can have a plan that actually has unlimited data, but it is only for a cellular device. It is not for a tethering device like this that is gonna have a bunch of other devices connected. That is cheating, and the cellular providers don't want you to do that. But if you wanna cheat, you can go ahead and get a Mophie. So a Mophie router is basically a cellular LTE router that turns a LTE connection into both ethernet and Wi-Fi for you, which is really great. And it also allows you to mount directional antennas if, for example, you have a very weak cell signal and you need to point it in a particular direction. Now, what this does is it accepts a SIM card and allows you to do a number of things. The most important of which is pretend that you are a phone over the network. That way the network never throttles you and you can take advantage of some of these truly unlimited plans that don't allow you to share that network connection with other devices like in a hotspot or an old cell phone. Now a Mophie, as you can see, is a bit expensive. It's about 300, sometimes you can see them for up to $400. But the benefit here is that you can actually be able to trick the network into giving you truly unlimited and fast speeds without a huge investment in something like a signal booster. Okay, so let's say that that's still not working. Well, all right, there's some things you can still do, even if the signal is so terrible that one of these is consistently getting what ours is, which is something like this. Now, we almost never get more than three bars, and you can see here that our signal strength is fair, and if that's the best you're getting, you're gonna be pretty frustrated with your speed. Now, I went ahead and clocked our speed here, and you can see on an average day, we're getting about four, maybe five uh, down and 3.3 up. So by far, so far, this is our fastest option for uploading things. We're able to upload a gigabyte of files in maybe 20 minutes most of the time that we need to upload a video file. So in truth, a cellular, cellular connection is probably your best bet, but you might notice some random quirks, such as in bad weather, the signal dropping down, and sometimes a cellular tower going down for maintenance where suddenly the signal will totally cut out. 
which can totally mess things up if you're uploading things overnight. All right, so one of the last things you can do if you're really, really frustrated is take a look at a signal booster. Now, a signal booster is going to amplify the signal between the tower and your Mophie adapter. So if you wanna use something like that, then this is much more of an investment because the best ones of these cost up to $900. And you do need to do some research to make sure that the proper frequency is being boosted. And really, this is kind of a rabbit hole to get into. So if you're at the point where you need a signal booster, you probably need to do some additional research into making sure that you're boosting the right band and that you are receiving on the same channel that you're boosting on your Mophie the adapter. Now going back to the screenshot of the Mofi, you can see that the band B12 is listed here. So if I was shopping for a signal booster, I would need to make sure that that's the band I was boosting and I was also not operating on frequencies that aren't uh, in the United States as we accidentally had a couple of pieces of uh, hardware delivered that did. Now, on that vein, if you really want to strike out and do something that we haven't tested, there are cheaper solutions than the Mofi, such as this Microtech unit here. But again, you need to be careful with these sorts of things because often these cheaper devices can be shipped out uh, either focusing on the round frequencies or meant for the European Union rather than the United States. So that can be pretty frustrating if you're trying to set up a connection, you're out in the middle of nowhere and then you get a device that doesn't work. So before buying one of these devices, make sure to do your homework, but something like this, unlike the Mofi, just connects to an ethernet port and rather than providing a Wi-Fi network, it just provides a single ethernet net line in and can be, can be powered over power over ethernet. Now, last up, if you want to really desperately try to combine all these solutions, you can look into something called channel bonding, which is pretty cool and is able to combine all these, although it's a paid service that we plan on doing a different video on later. Basically, the way it works is it combines all these sources of internets, chops up your packets, and then sends them to a source using all the available bandwidth where they're reassembled and sent to the internet at large. So you can theoretically get uh, the cumulative amount of speed of all these devices running at the same time and avoid having a bunch of different networks all disconnected that aren't sharing their speed when you could just have one that's kind of load balanced by the system. Either way, this is pretty challenging and I hope you've learned something about your options when you're in the middle of nowhere because we have learned a lot making mistakes out here uh, when there's no connection for us to rely on. It can be expensive and frustrating to get a fast and consistent internet signal when you're in the middle of nowhere. But if you know what to do, you can use the right equipment to minimize your setup so you're not spending a bunch of extra money on something that's not just not going to work. Now, if you don't have a lot of open sky, and also if you're not willing to deal with the latency, satellite is probably not the best option for you. And if you're in an area with incredibly terrible cell reception, then maybe a directional antenna or a cell booster might be able to get you back in the area that you need to be. Whatever the solution is, you should be aware that there are some ways you can combine these to make sure that you get the best possible usage out of all of your connections at the same time. This is called channel bonding, and you should stay tuned for another video on Nullbyte about this, pending and getting approved. That's all we have for this episode of Cyber Weapons Lab. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you got confused, you can check out the Nullbyte article linked in the description. If you have any ideas for upcoming episodes, send me a message on Twitter at Cody Kinsey, because I'd love to hear from you. We'll see you next time.